I'm Len DeFrancisi, and we are at the American Italian Cultural Center in New Orleans, Louisiana. This is a museum here that uh, showcases Italian, uh, American Italian heritage. So this is a uh, macaroni cutter. Uh, this particular uh, machine was probably vintage 1935. It was made by my great-grandfather. Uh, he was known as being a hydraulics wizard. An interesting part about this, about this machine is at the time, uh, a lot of the uh, macaroni, so you, you would dry spaghetti on a stick, okay, then you would take that spaghetti off the stick and its long lengths, and then you would put it down here, and this machine would go chop, chop, and chop it to length so you can then put it in storage, okay? So, uh, the, this machine used hydraulics to drive the, the ram, so it was much more efficient than what was happening before, you would have actual cutting wheels, kind of like a saw, that would actually cut the spaghetti to length. So this was an innovation by my, by my great grand, but, excuse me, by my grandfather, who developed this technology. The machine model is called a, uh, it's right here, it's the HMC. HMC is the model uh, of this machine. It's made by Consolidated Macaroni Manufacturing, a machine manufacturing company that was, um, Initially was I.D. Franchisi and Son, which was my great-grandfather. That became then merged with some other competition in the area and they became, in 1926, they became Consolidated Macaroni Machinery um, Company. And then from there, the company became Demaco in 1952 um, and still Demaco to this day. So Demaco uh, was formed uh, in 1914 um, by my great-grandfather. Uh, but this particular machine was made by, uh, in, uh, by, my, by my grandfather. Um, this machine was actually just taken out of service, I think just a few years ago, by Fresina Macaroni Company. Um, so, I mean, it, it was made in 1935 or so and used in operation all the way up until probably just a few years ago and then brought to this museum and, and placed here. So that just kind of tells you about the, 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 the long-lasting nature of of these of these machines that were built in those days. Thanks for coming tonight and we're very lucky to have Leonard De Francisi here. He's a colonel in the Marine Corps and actually stationed in Louisiana so that's why we get him tonight. <laughs> He's a fourth generation Italian American and his family's been in the pasta business since 1914. So he's got a wealth of knowledge. So without further ado. Thank you, Thank you so much for inviting me. I greatly appreciate it. Um, uh, though I'm stationed here in New Orleans uh, on the West Bank, you know, Colonel in the Marine Corps in one of the units there, the Deputy Commander for Force Headquarters Group, I'm actually li I'm a reservist, so I actually live in Melbourne, Florida. That's where my, my company headquarters is. We build our machines in the United States, so they're American-made uh, machines. We'll talk a little bit more about that, and I'll introduce some more about myself and my family as, as we go through the slides, because I'm intricately involved in every way in my family and in the business. So as, as mentioned, I, I uh, fourth generation pasta machine builder. So we built, these are not small little hand crank machines. These are um, industrial machines used by many of the pasta, just about every single pasta brand I got at start had some connection with our company using some of our machines, including uh, some of the ones right here uh, in, in New Orleans. In fact, the, the little uh, antique machine that you see when you walked in, that is one of the machines that was built. We'll talk a little bit more about that. By my by my uh, by my grandfather, so uh, um, you know long history in this business. Next slide. But I have truth in advertising. The, the presentation is not just about <laughs> pasta in Louisiana. It's it's going to be about really pasta in the United in the United States. Uh, and of course, to get started with that, though, we're going to go back in time a little bit. And uh, you know, the legend is, of course, uh, the Italians will tell you that Marco. The, the, uh, one of the legends about pasta is that, that Marco Polo brought um, pasta into Italy. Um, and, uh, you know, the, but the Italians will adamantly uh, dispute that myth. And in reality, the, uh, the truth is that really it's such a basic food that probably just about every single culture 
uh, had a form of pasta and easily would have been able to create it on their own. But uh, what made uh, Marco Polo so unique is that when he came, he wrote uh, um, a book, and we'll talk about that in a second, that, well, he didn't write it. De Pisa actually wrote it based on his, based on his, on his travels, and this was in the 1300s. So um, um, the book was recited in the piazzas all through Italy, because these are wonderful stories they're about, and in that book he references pasta. So it was more like one of the early days of advertising about pasta. So that's why it really, that's why he's so associated with, with the legend of, of, of bringing pasta into Italy. Uh, Thomas Jefferson brought macaroni to the U.S. and we'll talk about that in a second. And this I want to show you real quick, it's funny, pasta's not grown on trees. This was an, <laughs> this was an advertise, BBC did an April Fool's uh, skit about pasta growing on trees and it really caught on. A lot of people <laughs> believe it, but, but it's not grown on trees. Uh, next slide. So we talked about this is the actual text in Marco Polo's in the in the uh, in the book um, about what he talked about. He didn't say pasta, of course, but he, he mentioned you know basically what it was. And again, the circular you know think of this as the modern day commercial for pasta, and that's really what this book was in the in the way it was you know the stories that were told from this book. So he does have a place in history for uh, for pasta without a doubt. And it, I'll tell you when you go to Italy, the uh, they even have a museum basically dedicated to proving that Italy was, that pasta was in Italy before Marco Polo. So it's kind of really, they, they're very sensitive about it there. Uh, next slide. And this is uh, found in Egyptian tomb. You know, obviously you see, you know, some uh, bread making process of forming dough, you know, similar to how pasta is made. So obviously it, it goes way back before Marco Polo. Uh, next slide. So now a little bit, we'll talk a little bit about the process of making pasta. And uh, this, this is a good des description. In, in, the, uh, in the early days of kind of the, the, the early start of the, of the Industrial Revolution, so to speak, the, the earliest parts of that, pasta was in the industrial setting was actually made in three steps. And it was a batch process. We so made a distinct amount of pasta uh, per day. And the process went like this. You had a, a mixer, a kneader. You see kind of the jolly old fellow there in his underwear is, is mixing the dough and kind of reminiscent of, of maybe wine making. But, you know, he's in there uh, mixing it away with his, with, his, uh, with his feet. And then you got these, you know, three gentlemen all in their, uh, all in their underwear, of course. So I'm sure it was hot. And as the Italians would say, they're, the Sicilians would say, probably say mutandinis. But they're bouncing up and down, on, and that was the kneading phase of the pasta. So, you, so they made a discrete amount in the mixer. And this guy would grab it up, take it on his, you know, on his chest, it's getting some chest hairs in there, I'm sure. <laughs> and uh, down there in the chute where they would bounce it up and down for some kneading. And then again, they you know, pick it up and then it would go into this machine with the screw you see on the, on the, on the top left there. They would uh, actually uh, push the pasta, a sliver of pasta through a die a bronze dye that would actually form it. So three steps. Uh, we're going to talk more about that in a second. Next slide. Uh, and then, the, and so the man, the, the, the gentleman that was in charge of all this was called a pastayo, and he was the master pa pasta maker. He would be like a, you know, a tradesman of the day, kind of like a cobbler or a fletcher. You know, this was a union guy who had a specific job and he had a very s significant responsibility for making sure the pasta is done right. So after that process you just saw, or they used the three machines, they would actually droop the pasta on these sticks. So the reason spaghetti is long the way it is had a functional uh, reason, and that is, you know, it was dried on the sticks. And um, this is the fellow here, you know, he's responsible for making sure it's, it's dried just right. He would chew the, the, the flies away, the dogs away, and all that as part of his responsibility trying to make it as sanitary as possible that he, that he can. Uh, you know, and Naples, which became very famous for the pasta, probably some of the best, you know, pasta in the world was at the time made in Naples. And really it's because they had probably the, you know, not only the best, some of the best wheat around, which is semolina's durum, it's actually durum, uh, comes from uh, durum uh, wheat. Um, is, is, it has a very great blend right there in, in, uh, in that region. 
So some of the best pasta was made that the climatic condition plus the ingredients, and that's, so that's where a lot of this comes from. Next slide. And then, so the length, you know, we, you saw the pasta, it was on the, on the, on the sticks, but there's also a functional reason why it, for eating it. In the old days, they just, they just cooked it and they just ate it, just straight down. You know, and a lot of, a lot of very uh, um, less fortunate people use pasta as a staple. And so there was you know, multiple functional reasons why spaghetti is the shape that it is. And this spaghetti, of course, is the most popular shape of pasta today. And of course, these street vendors, kind of like this is the Burger King of the day. So you literally, you know, you walk down the street, you would see these vendors all cooking pasta. They're very cheap to get a, a bowl of it uh, to, 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 to feed yourself. Uh, next slide. Now, we're going to talk about the United States just for a second. So, in, in, uh, in England, a macaroni was a person that was an extremely well-dressed person, a dandy, so to speak. And they had this outrageous, uh, outrageously de uh, dressed. And so the English, um, in the revolution, they were saying to the Americans, they were taunting the Americans, and you all know the song, Yankee Doodle went to town riding on a pony, stuck a feather in his cap and called it macaroni. They were taunting the Americans, basically saying that, hey, you know, the Americans, they're a bunch of rubes. They think that all they have to do is to stick a feather in a cap and they can be a macaroni. So the Americans kind of turned it around on the British and said, see, you know, they think we're just a bunch of colonials here. They don't respect us, so they use that as kind of the war cry uh, in, in the revolution. So that's where that, that song kind of came, that's where that song came from. Uh, next slide. So we get Archimedes. Um, this is uh, the Archimedes screw, what Archimedes was famous for. Uh, next slide. Let's talk about how that's important. Now, this is Thomas Jefferson. This is actually from the, uh, the, uh, the, his, uh, from the, uh, his museum, where he hand drew, based on his travels to Paris, a macaroni machine. And as you can see, and this is his invention. He actually invented using with the Archimedes screw concept of coming down to push the do, push the dough down. So, you know, Archimedes plays a role. That's the that is the invention of Thomas Jefferson, and bringing he basically is credited for bringing pasta in first introducing pasta into the United States. Um, and it's based on his, his his time as as a ambassador to Paris, basically. Uh, next slide. So now we'll talk about. Uh, uh, this is one of the machines that, uh, you know, how it was done in the Industrial Revolution as, as technology started to improve. This is the first press that my great-grandfather made, Ignazio di Francisi. And you can see, again, the Archimedes screw is on the top there, big part of, the, you know, how it works to push, push product. So this is, again, the three steps of the process. This is the last step. You put a die here, and this ram, uh, mechanical ram, would push push that chunk of dough, push it through the die. So that's what this machine does. Next slide. And this is the other parts of that. So you got the mixer and you got the, this which is called a gromola. This was that, this is the kneader. So this is this machine here is what actually, what needs the dough. So you need all three in, in this time period, the early phase of the industrial, you need all three machines to, to make pasta. Next slide. And here's, you can kind of see these machines in operation in the early plant. Uh, next slide. Now this is a modern, modern day machine, just so show how it looks today. And this machine here combines all three of those steps in one machine. And um, machinery designers in the United States had a big role in making this happen. So, so Italian Americans that came here actually were some of the inventors who brought this technology online that's used today. But you, well, you, know, you have the mixer here, the kneader is in a screw that's right here, um, and, that's, and it's all in one continuous machine. So nobody touches anything. The flour goes in, pasta comes out, one continuous operation, not a, not a discrete batch. You don't have somebody picking it up and moving it from one, one machine to another. No flies you know, that, are, that are introduced into the 
into the into the process. So that's how state of the art basically today. Next slide. So uh, moving back to, uh, to the to the story, uh, about four million roughly Italians immigrated to the U.S. Uh, in this period, and this is of course mostly through mostly through Ellis Island. Uh, next slide. But about 100,000, you know, eventually took up home in this area here. That number may be, you know, may not be 100% right, but that's a, a rough estimate from, um, from my research. And, of course, I think this, this is right here, literally right down the street. They, they call this area the Spaghetti District. Uh, it's very close to where we are today. I'm not as familiar with the geography. Maybe somebody can help me out. But I think this is that's literally right across water. the street, right? In the French Quarter. French Quarter, not on too the far. Other the side of Canal Street. Street. Isn't right. that where Irene's restaurant is? Yeah. So they. Irene's on Charles and Saint Philip. Right. So they call this the uh, the Spaghetti District, and that's where you know. So the Italians took up home in basically in the part of the French Quarter. Next slide. So pasta was basically once it was made and dried, you know, it was basically sold in stores like this. Uh, dry goods stores, and so you see there are loose bins of pasta in the in the bins, and you say I want a certain amount. It's not like in the boxes and bags today. And we'll talk about that in a second. And a lot of the pasta companies came from they had these they were bread manufacturers. So they the, the Italians that came to the United States, they were making bread, and then they had this huge request for pasta. Every all the Italians as they immigrated in said, well, we, you know, thanks for the bread, but we also want pasta. So a lot of the early pasta manufacturing companies really started out in bread factories, so they, you, they did both. They did bread and pasta in the same, in the same place. Question? Sure. Keep taking questions now or at the end? Please, anytime. Interrupt me if you got something. Pasta in the, uh, in the bins, is it all the same? Just one straight pasta? We're not talking different types of pasta, sizes, and so forth? A absolutely. Um, so the question is, is, in the bins that have the pasta, like we saw in the dry goods store, is it just the same exact pasta? Or is there different shapes? Um, you know, obviously there's millions of different shapes, sure. regional basis on shapes. There's all kinds of you know, even the same shape has two different names based on two different areas in Italy. So to answer your question, those bins would have different shapes. Um, some short good, some long good, because um, it's easy to make different shapes by just changing out the die itself, and that's that's how you you can make you know. So you have all this equipment. And then you can change the way the shape, the, pot, the actual shape that's made, just by a die. And, it, and making dies is a whole art. It's literally, th you know, tens of thousands of, of an inch are used in the machining process to get the curls and the ripples and, and the, you know, shells and all that stuff. So it's an art in, within itself. One more question. Please. You talked in the very first slide of <clears throat> flour and water. Yes. That's it. That's it. Nothing else. That's it. Now, if you want to make an egg noodle, you can, you can do that. And, of course, the taste would be, you know, that would make it much more tasty. And we'll talk, I mean, that's, what, that's the traditional pasta. We can talk a little bit more about um, um, uh, what's happening today. Because now, with the, what we see today and the, the, the trends, uh, and you, you're kind of, Stealing my thunder for the kind of towards the end. The, art, the artisanal pasta business is they're, they're doing a lot of stuff that they're adding to pasta, you know, spinach based, um, gluten free. So you're taking, you know, you're taking wheat out completely and you're going to other products to make it, you know, a whole wheat pasta. There's all kinds of different things that are coming out. That's kind of what the trend is that we see in this, this, this day and age. And in fact, you know, regional based, you know, sometimes. Based on the region, you see something very specific that that particular pasta company is making. Kind of like craft beer, you know, they, they orient the, the, the products for, for the local clientele. And some of that is because chefs are um, running these places, so they have, you know, an eye for flavors, the local flavors, and mixing it in. So we see a lot of innovation in that way. But the, the traditional pasta just, and it's not really, it's not. I mean, flour is the cheap way to go, and some companies will, will use flour. It's really semolina and, and water. So I just want to make, you know, to, so to do real, real pasta, if you, you, know, you want to talk about it with American and Italians, they'll say 
they'll say semolina because that is the real. It's a blend. It's a it's a it's a grind. It's a type of grind of durum wheat, and that's what what uh, forms pasta. So that's it. Now you certainly can make it tasty if you put a little egg in there. So if you you know you certainly can do that if you want to make it a little and and you know some. Uh, sheeted pastas, you know, sometimes it's filled and stuff, so obviously there's other things in there, like, you know, ravioli, tortellini. Uh, next slide. So Zeriga, this is a company, it's in, it's in Brooklyn, but I want to point this out because this, this is considered the oldest pasta company. They're still in business today. They're from 1848, uh, and uh, they, are, they, they, were, they started in Brooklyn and they moved to, to, uh, to New Jersey. Next slide. And just, I just think that this is so funny. This, this, you know, the, in, the, in the day, that was their brand, glutaroni. You know, ideal food for children. So, and even the dogs love it. You know, the dog is salivating. So this is this. This is a uh, you know funny funny. Uh, and glutaroni, if you say that today, will probably. Well, you know, I don't know if I want that one. So it's kind of interesting in uh, seeing the advertisement of the day. Uh, next slide. Um, all right, so. Um, back to the history, um, due to the ban on imports, uh, pasta was not, was not coming from Italy, from Italy anymore. So there was almost none coming in. So this is when we really saw a lot of the, the pasta industry in the United States really grow uh, quite a bit. But the, the clientele was still Italian. So the only people that were, it was still considered an ethnically based food. So the only the clientele that was eating pasta at the time was was really Italians, but it was more of it was being made in the United States. Next slide. Um, so uh, I, you know, Brooklyn is the epicenter for for where, where it grew, and this is where uh, where our and the reason why my, my great grandfather started the company here is because all his all the other all the other companies that were buying his equipment were were right there down the street, like the Metropolitan Macaroni Company was right down the street from from where he built the machines. And the foundries, you saw those big cast iron pieces that were made to make the machines. The cast, those were built, you know, those were poured right there. And so my grandfather used to tell these stories, my great grandfather, um, my grandfather would tell these stories about how when they were moving these machines, and these things were heavy, you saw that machine. And this is not a time when we had ability to move stuff like we do today. They would have these horse-drawn carriages that would move this equipment. And if they didn't get it to, to the final destination, they would just leave it in the street. Mm -hmm. And they would come back the next day and continue to move it. And nobody would, <laughs> and nobody would take it. So he used to tell these, these stories about that. OK, next slide. So this is, this is the, my, grandpa's, my great grandpa's company. That is my grandfather right there, this tall gentleman. So funny. He's got his dirty overalls and a tie on. I can't even imagine mm -hmm. that today. And then my, his father, my great grandfather, is the gentleman next to him. And they were really all Italian Americans, and they all, um, a lot of them were relatives, so they all came to, uh, to work for him. And this is one of the first actual, uh, this is a short good line, and this is one of the first continuously made pasta lines. So go, this is what, this is uh, the 30s. This is what, I think this, in this picture is in your, in your, is right here in this museum. So this is now the company's called Consolidated Macaroni Company, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, uh, next slide. And this is uh, um, the factory in, in not you know in the in the 80s right here. But the, what I wanted is, is they all knew each other. And these are the Italians. Um, it's you know uh, the the Cardinale who has made this pasta, this brand of pasta, literally is right right next door to where this factory ended up. So you know they all they all knew each other, and that's how come. A lot of this ended up in that in that particular region. Next slide. And this is invented in by Americans, by well Italian Americans. And this is what this machine here is what made um, the ability to make continuously made pasta. This machine right here, designed and built by Italian Americans, not Italians but Italian Americans. And so what happened is, in the old days, part of being a pastaio is when the pasta came off the extruder, you see he had the, the knife there. He would take that knife and he would cut it. And there was this art to it. And you would take it, and there's two different ways. There was the Neapolitan way, 
and there was a Sicilian way. And they used to fight about which one was the best way, like only Italians can do. And so they would take this pasta after it was cut with the knife, and they would throw it onto the stick, the spaghetti stick, so it can be, go out to dry. Um, and then this came out. And so my, my grandfather was actually afraid because he thought the, all these guys with these knives were going to come after him and say, you, you're taking my job away. But it, it actually didn't, that didn't happen. Um, uh, they actually went out to, to do different jobs in, in the factory. But there was, you know, that it was, progress was, you know, hindered by some of that. Uh, but this machine here really uh, revolutionized the business. And what happened was the dies were round. You saw the pictures, the dies were round. He made a, a rectangular die. He said, let's not make them round, let's make them skinny, long, and rectangular, and go right above the stick, and then cut it above the stick, and it would just fall right onto the pot. So that's basically what the patent is. This patent was so strong that even Italians were, if you can believe it, in Italy were actually importing this machine into Italy. I mean, uh, today, we, that would never happen. We never, you know, it would be very unusual for us to for, that, for the Italians who have all, where all our competition is, would, would actually import an American machine. But in, in this day, they did. Um, next slide. And so this is La Rosa. Um, you see again, you see the pasta being made. And what I want to point out about them is, next slide. This guy, Italian-American uh, from Brooklyn, was a, was a genius. And he's the one who came out with the box. So he said individual boxes, not this bins and all that. Let's put it in an individual customer, you know, user-friendly box that can be uh, sold separately for people. So this, uh, this innovation was, came really from, from the Italian Americans from the United States. And of course, that was a big, wild success for the company to do that. As you can see, the, the ladies uh, packing the pasta into, into the, into the uh, blue. This is actually blue for some reason, I guess, Blue is the color to, to match against pasta, and then they would stick it in the box. So they have great care in boxing and stuff. Next slide. And so I just threw this up because uh, this is actually, so I want to tell you about my family a little bit. So you heard about my, my great-grandfather and my grandfather were, made the pasta machines, right? So on my mother's side, they made pasta. And this is my grandmother. So the, my, my grandfather on my mother's side was a pasta maker and their whole family was involved in the business. And so through my, uh, my great grandfather and my grandfather on the other side, they said, oh, well, we have a nice boy you want to meet. I mean, you'd go around <laughs> selling, you know, you know the story. <laughs> and so that's how my mother and father you know, met each other. So I'm a product, literally, of pasta on both sides. <laughs> and, uh, and so my, my, you know, my, grand, my grandfather on my mother's side was a hopeless romantic. And, you know, he came up with this brand, Julieta, um, based on Romeo and Julia. And, uh, but I, he, he used to say it was, my, it was really my aunt, but I, you know, my aunt was not a blonde, so that couldn't be. But it's really uh, from, from Romeo and Juliet. Uh, next slide. So, um, now we'll talk a little bit about how pasta crosses cult, uh, cultural boundaries. You know, after World War I, it was, it, 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 pasta expanded in the United States, but really still ethnic, still Italian, mostly in Italian communities. Well, here's where the pasta really crossed ethnic boundaries as, as a result of World War II. Because let's face it, pasta is a great food for feeding soldiers and Marines and, and the military. So, uh, and believe it or not, it wasn't just the soldiers that were exposed, this is the interesting thing when I did this research, was it wasn't just the soldiers that were exposed to Italy that, you know, when they were going through the European campaigns in Europe, but actually the Marines, this is actually Marine raiders um, on Japanese islands, they actually get, were exposed because they captured uh, um, Japanese noodles. So they actually got ex also got exposed so on both fronts, on both you know, sides of the globe, forces from all over the United States actually were exposed to pasta during the war. And when they came back, um, and they even talk about, you know, it was in the newspaper about, uh, about the whole issue of pasta and as they were becoming exposed to it. So, uh, next, so next slide. 
And of course, they had like to have these fun games. You know, I love this. This is so funny. You got the uh, the the uh, the GIs, you know, with the pasta on one side, and this lady looked like she's horrified. But I guess I guess they had these games uh, um, where you know, so they just kind of promoted the uh, the pasta, see how it's really starting to catch on, even in the games and the fun and that they were having, that they were starting to do these these pasta. Next slide. So back to uh, New Orleans. This is Mardi Gras. Um, it, you know, uh, <laughs> you can see you know it's part of the festivities, part of the celebration before uh, you know you had to stop all that. Uh, and uh, I don't know if this is true, but a crew of, of Virgilians, maybe somebody can, here can tell me a little bit more about that. But I guess that's the the crew that really was the Italian Americans yeah, that that forms yeah, that. Yeah, Christina, you're the expert, so. Well, just that they, the Italians weren't allowed in the brews at the time, so they started their own Virgilians, and they had it until they were, until things opened up, and then it went defunct. They closed up and started being parts of other crews. Yeah, so the Italians were, were uh, um, not allowed in the other crews, um, not invited, I guess. I'm not sure the whole detail of that part of the story, but they they so they started their own, and that's the, the one. And anyway, this is, you can see the big part of the celebration um, is, is pasta. Uh, next slide. So here's one of the, the small pasta companies. This is uh, New Orleans Macaroni Manufacturing Company. I don't know where this is. I, I tried to figure it out where it is, but my, the point of this was that there were, there were small macaroni companies like this all over, you know, cropping up after. Uh, um, there was a, a big macaroni factory, I think, down in Charters. There were was Okay, next next slide. We're going to talk about that one. Okay. But we'll get to that in this. We'll get to that one at Cusimano in a second. Uh, the spaghetti houses. This was very common. These, these these this one is in New Orleans, but these were all over the particularly in the South. I see these mostly. Um, but they're basically like you know you can go. They're almost like fast food places to get to get a pasta dish. Uh, so they're very they're very popular. Um, very you know you can kind of in and out, you go on a lunch, you can go quickly and get a bowl of pasta. So this is another way that it really got prom pasta got promulgated in these kind of fast food places. This would be kind of like the bird, you know, old Burger King of the day. Uh, they were calling them spaghetti houses. And this one is right here in New Orleans somewhere. Um, they closed now. They're maybe closed, but this was a this was I guess and apparently a, a, a famous a famous one. Okay, next slide. Uh, this is the Cusimano. This is the one Christina was talking about. Um, this this was a, this is a very in fact the gentleman on one of these tablets is right here. Uh, so obviously he was a a um, uh, doing successful. Uh, where did I see his name? I was looking. Yeah. So Cusimano um, obviously uh, became very successful. He was he had this he made this pasta factory. I was originally on Phillips Street, which was probably, you know, probably pretty close to where we are now. Uh, he then w partnered with a Frenchman in 1902, and they built a new factory, much bigger because it was growing quite a bit. Um, at, at the corner of this is where you were talking about, where now the Richelieu Hotel is, and uh, that's the Richelieu. This is the Richelieu Hotel, um, but that's where that that's where the pasta factory was, and they said it was. The capacity was a thousand boxes daily, and the largest in the South. So this, from that, the the the, uh, the breakaway from that become the Southern Macaroni Manufacturing Company in 1914, <coughs> and that's the luxury brand. Is anybody? Uh, it's big. It's a big brand. I know they. This is a this is a big brand here, and so that one is that's the the. So they just went, you know, not too long ago, over 100 years old that brand. So it's still around today. Uh, next slide. And then, of course, the Progresso. Uh, again, these gentlemen that you see, uh, Udo, um, is, is the name that you see on the wall here. And uh, his partner, Tar Taranto, is also on the wall there. So obviously, by the time that these tablets were made, these people were doing pretty well for themselves. They, I guess they donated, what, $100? So they must be making some, I don't know what that is to, in those days, with those being today's dollars, but I'm sure it was a lot. So that, you know, this Progresso, the suit was 
was basically um, came, came from, the genesis of progressive soup came from this area. And, you know, this is very, this was a, a relatively uh, uh, um, not to do immigrant who came, uh, uh, Giuseppe Udo and his wife came here and they got hooked up with Kuzumato and he helped them out. He was actually, the story that, uh, well, is that he was giving them cans from his discarded cans from his business, then uh, Giuseppe Udo's wife, Eleonora, would actually clean those cans and recycle them and uh, put, the, put the soups and the products in there and the, in the, in the um, um, tomatoes and, and the different products that were put in those cans. So they were kind of, she was an innovator, I have to say, you know, she's recycling and, and, and one of the uh, parts of, of a uh, key part of that, of that business. So, you know, uh, that team uh, was the forerunner of, of Progresso. And now the in so eventually Pillsbury acquired, when they get families getting out of the business, Pillsbury acquired um, uh, Progresso and then General Mills acquired it. So obviously it's one of the biggest brands still out there today. And the, kind of the, the unique thing about Progresso soup is that it's ready to eat. You know, you just cook it. You know, it's a canned soup that's ready to eat, unlike maybe some other soups where you have to actually add ingredients to it to actually make soup. So it's one of the few completely ready to eat um, um, soups. And it's, that was kind of the trademark all came from, from this area. Uh, next, next slide. So, of course, kind of talked about this a little bit already. There is some, you know, local flavors based on local recipes, based on the local cuisine of the area. So this was one of the recipes I saw that, uh, you know, there's probably a million. This is just one I, I threw on here. You all are very familiar, I'm sure, with, the, with using the local ingredients to make the, the dishes that you, that you enjoy at home and, uh, and the flavors that, that are come from this local area. Uh, next slide. And so I threw this up here. This is Eddie Spaghetti. He is from the Banshee Motorcycle Club from New Orleans. You know, it, it, uh, that's his nom de guerre was, is Spaghetti Eddie. But, and the reason I bring this up because so, pasta is such, such lore in the, in the United States now that people use it for their names. There's a whole do, you know, dozens and dozens of people that take either macaroni, spaghetti, lasagna as the part of their name. And rock bands even are using it. So it's kind of funny. Um, and this guy, in, you know, for all you motorcycle heads out there, this guy is, uh, if, you, if there's any motor heads, uh, this guy took the name of, of Eddie Spaghetti. Uh, next slide. So really, you know, pasta, the, the manufacturing of pasta, it, uh, it's highly logistical. And so it, it started to move away from the big cities like Brooklyn or here out into the suburbs because of the space constraints and the fact that you have to bring in a lot of wheat and you have to take out a lot of product, so you have to be near, to, to make the higher capacities that these companies are trying to make as the population grew, as the, popu as the pasta got more popular, they actually started you know, having to get away from the cities themselves, okay? So uh, that forced a lot of the companies out of, out of the cities and into the, the suburban areas. And then, and they, but they were still basically really family-owned companies um, all the way up until the 1980s. 1980s, there was a huge consolidation in the industry where basically these big, really big, massive factories, mostly in the, in the breadbasket states of North Dakota, the Dakotas and Minnesota and great Montana, that's where, you know, close to the, where the, where the semolina, the durum is, they're close to the ingredients and they just, they can make the pasta there. And so a lot of this became consolidated into those, those areas and away from, away from the more regional um, manufacturing companies that were existing all the way up to that time. And it was there, a lot of the families got out of the business. So now it's mostly corporations that, that do, that make the pasta. However, having said that, the re most recent trend, as we discussed based on the question that was already asked, what we're seeing now is now these artisanal pasta companies are coming back into the fold again. These are small companies that are, uh, you know, chefs that run them, that are focused on quality, on nutritional pastas, gluten-free, doing innovative stuff, adding additional ingredients, 
and doing all kinds of different things to enhance the flavors of pasta, get some excitement about the pasta, really focus on quality instead of just mass production, really focus on the quality. And so that's what we're seeing today. Kind of like, like I mentioned earlier, kind of the craft beer industry is similar is what we're seeing. Can you pronounce that word for me, please? Pastayo. So the question is, that, what, what, and that's the master pasta maker. So if you're at home and you, you make pasta, you can be, call yourself the pastaya. Or you, I'm sorry, you would be pastaya. Uh -huh. I want to make sure I get this right. <laughs> um, OK, next, next slide. OK, so we can't be com complete without uh, the, the, about Elvis and about uh, Sophia Loren. Uh, Believe it or not, she was the. She said this quote: "Everything I, you see, I owe to spaghetti." <laughs> I believe. I, hope, I believe it. <laughs> and she was dubbed the Macaroni Queen in 1955. So Elvis is, of course, one of his favorite dishes. So the King and Queen, they both love pasta. Talk about the evolution of the, these small mom and pop pasta companies in, back in the turn of the century. What kind of equipment did they use? Um, and some dates on how that, you know, that evolution went. So, uh, you know, it's easy to say when you're in Brooklyn, you're right there next to the big ones. But I do know that uh, we, our records show that we shipped equipment to this area. Luxury pasta, Frazina had one of our little machines right there. So the size of the machines are going to be um, much smaller. In, in these in the more in these areas, so they would be a little bit easier to move. So most of the companies around here would be smaller in comparison to the ones you would see with the bigger equipment in Brooklyn, per se. Around 1914. So 1914 is when you I I, I, I pegged 1914 as a big year. And you saw luxury brands are in 1914. We built our first press in 1914. La Rosa was 1914. I think Ronzoni was also 1914. So there's a whole slew of co companies that started in 1914. So I would say if you want to peg a date, 1914 is a key year when they started making these bigger, bigger pasta machines. Before that, where did they get the machines from? They would get them from, uh, they, they would be um, brought to here. They would put on ships to get them over here so that they can actually um, move this stuff. So they'd have to bring it to a port, load it on a ship move it to this area so you're not going to get it overnight, obviously. And I would say a lot of the equipment also came from Italy. You know, they were probably getting some of that stuff from, from Italy as well. Um, I, I, you know, I don't have any records that show Italian machines that far back, but I'm assuming some of the really small stuff, they were probably getting some of it from Italy as well. But um, you know, just because the, 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 great, the equalizer on moving stuff is ships. And so you put it on a ship and you're going to get it to this area, even the bigger stuff. So the big leap in, and you got to remember, so if you look at the, if you can go back, I don't know if somebody can bring it back to the slides where you show the industrial company. Keep going, because it's kind of neat, actually. I want to point something out. Uh, keep going. All right, keep going. All right, actually, go, move forward. Um, you show the, the so from a manufacturing perspective, keep one more. If you look at the top of this factory, you'll see a bunch of pulleys, right? So all of the machines were run, there was one generator in the factory, and there's all these pulleys on the top, and you had these belts, and you'd throw these belts onto the pulley, and, and that would you know, turn the, the mechanics of the machine. And there was bobic bearings, they're, these, they're basically brass bearings that um, would hold this long drive shaft. And actually, my father told me stories when he was, they had to be oiled every day. And he would tell, um, he would have, that was one of his first jobs in the company, was to oil these bobbit bearings. And there would be drips on the ground. And he would, when his father wasn't looking, he would just shoot a little oil on the ground and say, yeah, I, but Dad, I, I need to go out and play football. I, I oiled all the bearings. See the fresh oil on the ground? So anyway, um, so all, and, and this, this lathe here was actually Civil War. Lathe, they, my grandfather talked about how and when they really, this is a small company, and when they actually made stuff, it would actually stick out. Of, they had to open the door, and, 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 uh, and the parts would actually go out into the street. But uh, the, the, big, you know, the big thing is this whole, the whole drive system is what I was saying. 
And if you go back and look at the machines, go, if somebody can, I'll show you how, what I mean by that. Um, keep going. This right here is good. This is that, where that belt would go, right there. And that drives the whole machine here. So you slap that thing on the belt. That goes on that bobbit bearing system. And so that's all the kind of the key to the Industrial Revolution. And if you go back up forward one more, you'll see, oh, no, the other way. This has the, the same thing. Mm -hmm. And you can't see it on this one, but it's, it's on, yeah, here it is, kind of in the back here. So, but let me, that's a, you know, I want to say more another thing because it gets to this machine that, that's here that from uh, Consolidated Macaroni Manufacturing Company, which is um, my, my grandfather's company. That was hydraulic. So there was a jump in technology in the 30s. So, um, and that came from the United States. A lot of this innovation in hydraulics came from the Navy. There was a lot of these ships were driven by hydraulics. So they, um, that machine, instead of using uh, this belt system, would actually drive. The, so that's a very efficient machine. It was actually driven by, by hydraulics. So that machine, what it would do is it's chop, chop. You know, you take the spaghetti off the stick, you put it onto that machine. It, it, by hydraulic uh, presses, it would come down and chuck, cut the spaghetti to length. So that I was, in the 30s, there was a big leap in technology moving away from this kind of mechanical setup into a hydraulic setup. So that was just a more efficient way of, of driving systems. And, and the United States, you know, engineers in the United States had a big role in moving the systems away from this mechanical to the hydraulic. So it's kind of an interesting tidbit of history. Now, I'm not sure if I answered all your questions, but That's good. Thank you. Um, just some, some, but so consolidate, I'll just say this too. Um, that was formed in 1926, okay? During the war, World War II, um, the consolidate was seized by the, by the, by the industrial production. They could no longer make, make um, pasta machines. They were directed by the, the government to make stuff for, uh, for the war effort. And so they made, no longer made pasta machines. They made things like Worthington pumps uh, for, and they made stretching machines that stretched metal over, air, uh, over aircraft for Grumman Corporation. They made tooling for the Norden bomb site. If you know what the Norden bomb site was, a, is a precision bomb site, so which, which allowed the Allies to bomb targets specifically instead of these mass carpet bombs. It was obviously saved a lot of, a lot of lives by just pinpointing. And this is all technology come from American, um, you know, and, and uh, um, Italian Americans who were involved with with the with the war effort making these things, so kind of interesting, uh, you know, part of history of of the company. And in fact, the Mac received a, a Navy Battle E or Consolidated received this award from the Navy Department for their work. But the fact that they didn't make pasta machines, they actually the, the irony was the pasta makers were importing machines from Italy. Let's just go figure, you know. So or from Europe, I shouldn't say Italy, from Europe. Um, from real, uh, from other countries in, um, that were not involved with the war. So, uh, any more questions? I uh, understand the concept of the dye and making the pasta, pushing the pasta through the dye. Could you explain the Pocatini dye? <laughs> okay, so I, I'm not going. I, I won't be able to explain it specifically about the Bucatini, um, but I'll say because I'm not a dye maker. Um, I'm a machinery maker, but I do know a little bit about dyes. Unfortunately, I wish I had a dye maker to tell you. But it is, uh, and so the question is, can you tell me about Bucatini dyes, you know, tell me, uh, you know, how is that done? So if you look at, uh, if you look at very, if you, if you look at, dye, if you really blue, if you look at the, uh, there's an insert in, in the dye, little inserts, brass inserts, is, you know, depending on the shape, there's, there's a whole slew of them that go into this big round disc. And that little insert has a very precision machined uh, geometry. And you know some of it is wider. If you, and these are very fine tolerances. We're talking tens of thousands of inches. I mean, so to the naked eye, it's very hard to see. But, if, but the machining technology is very uh, specific. 
it, you know, some of it's wider. So the flow, it's a, real, it's a rheological issue. So the flow on one part of it would be faster than another. So that's what gives it the curves, like for a shell or, or the different kind of, or, um, or, or different, or it might have ridges to make like a, like a penne or rigatoni, but, or a spiral uh, shape. Um, so that, that's, that's kind of the art of dye making. Yeah, but there's also a bias sometimes, like a penne. So that would actually, you'd have the dye would look like a bell, and then you would cut it. The cutters would actually be biased so that you get that kind of, that different shape. So there's two things going on. One is the actual form, you know, the actual uh, depth of the, of the dye, of the insert in the dye itself. And then you got the way the cutter is interacting with the die to get those shapes. Now, if you have one like that has a hole in the center, there's actually there's actually a pin on the die that holds like a a blank spot, so that it actually forms around that. And as the die goes in, it actually re reconforms, so you get that you get the hole in the center. And some of the larger, thicker passes have that to allow it to dry better. Because there is a whole art and science to drying, believe it or not. And there's a lot of technology and development right now related to drying, make it more efficient, more, I say there's, there's an area where there's a lot of development, more eco-friendly, more environmentally, you know, using, be more efficient so that we save um, on the, you know, green machine, so to speak. Any other questions? Could you say more about the drying? Because it seemed like they dried it on sticks for quite a long time. Yes. Do they do that now? And also making it here where it's so humid, was that an issue? Yes, all that is, all that is issues, yes. So it's the drying is a whole art to itself, and that's why the pastayo was so important, because he would be able to judge these things. Some, some, you know, some of it would have to be done outside, some of it would have to be moved back inside, some of it would have to be done with, get some air movement, some of it would actually have to add water back to it so it doesn't dry too fast, to keep the humidity you know, just right, because what you want when you dry pasta, it dries from the inside out. If it dries from the outside first, then you get this crystal glass shell on the outside of the pasta, and then um, the pasta can fracture, and you, it's called checking, is what the te terminology is, and then it would just break. So there, you have to dry from the inside out to make sure the water doesn't get trapped inside, because then you might have beautiful looking pasta here in, you know, New Orleans, but if you ship it out, to a northern state in the middle of winter, the, wa the, co the conditions may expand that water and then shatter it. So you have to be, the manufacturers have to take the, all that, and it's a science, it really is, and it, it's a computer controlled machine. So what used to take two, three days to dry, like in the street, street you know, the old manual way, now can be done in between six, you know, six hours or less some, in some cases in these very high, high um, temperature dryers that are, that, that are used today. So you get, you know, you're, use, you, you're using a very precise machine to, to control this whole, whole process. There's still a lot of people who do it by hand. They'll still do it, you know, the old-fashioned way. These artists and pasta guys and gals will make it, and will, will do it the old-fashioned way. And so they, they create, you know, they, they log this stuff in, and they record it, and they, when they, it's a trial and error, and then if that didn't work, then they, they change it again. They get the recipe just right and then they, they follow that suit. So you may have to change your, what, what's called the drying curve, what we call technical, technically the drying curve. You may have to change that seasonally too. Winter might be different than summer. So uh, all that stuff is part of the job of the pastayo. So this, this is why there's an art and science to making, good, to making good product. Now usually the drying conditions when you dry it slow, like on the streets, is much more forgiving than it is in one of those automatic machines, believe it or not. If you make a mistake in the settings on an automatic machine, you can m destroy a lot of product very quickly and, you, you know, generate, it's, it's, it's much more sensitive to the conditions. But, so, and all those shapes, different shapes, are, have a different drying curve to it. Question. Got involved with people here and sending machines here. Did you did you ever like send representatives? To, to A absolutely. So, 
Yeah, so we, we, there are stories about our family coming down to New Orleans, to some of the pasta companies. My, in fact, my father would come down here. But to, to, as far as getting the word out, technology, it's a good question that you ask. So there is one of the oldest trade organizations in the United States, believe it or not, is the, Na is the National Pasta Association. And it was called the Macaroni and Noodle Manufacturers Association. And it, I think it formed in 1904, if I'm not mistaken, but somewhere very early. So or even in the very early stages of, of pasta, they, they, there is an, a trade association that um, associated with the pasta industry. And they would have meetings at least once a year throughout the country. And so they didn't just do it in New York. They did it all over. Uh, I remember as a kid going to all different places with my family to these, to these meetings that they would do. Um, and in there, I've even looked at some of the old journals. And there's advertising of the equipment. There's advertising of the technology. And I've even seen some of these names that we talked about that were in those meetings. So I know for sure that the people that were made, the manufacturers that, were, that, that are here in, in New Orleans would be attending those meetings when all the people would be getting together and talking about the state of affairs in the industry. So that's one of the ways that technology transfer would happen. And that's how you know, down here would definitely be impacted by by what was happening in other places. I mentioned you know, Brooklyn is such an epicenter because of just a lot of different factors, just, and really because there's so many Italians in that area compared to the, the rest of the immigration centers where, where the Italians are. So there was just a lot of development in that particular area, and they couldn't, you know, it was one of the things, you know, my, my great-grandfather, believe it or not, he first came here, he had a patent within the first year of him being here. Wow. But the patent, literally, the patent was for shoes for buckle shoes and of course buckle shoes went out of you know went out of style almost literally as soon as he got his patent so he says forget it i'm you know i'm going to do stick to what do what i know how to do and what i know how to do is pasta so you know he got sucked right into the pot so a lot of italians just because all in that area all came together and either making pasta or making the machines to make pasta or working in the factories or there's this huge this huge impact on and not just pot but bread and you know Bread and pasta and pastries too. You know those those products, food. You know a lot of food um, industry, amongst the many other careers that they were in. But that's uh, you know I go back to Brooklyn a lot. But there that was just kind of the, the epicenter. And so, but the transfer of that went into all over the country. Does that did that answer your question? And um, what's your favorite pasta shape? Oh. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, do, I really like the spaghettoni, a good bite of the spaghettoni with a, with a good bite I really like. But I want to tell you about tortellini for a second. <laughs> so tortellini. So picture legend ends in Bologna. Where's my Bologna graduate? Right over there. Um, it's the tortellini capital of the world, right? Am I right? Okay. So you have the, the pastayo who's making, the, making ravioli. And he's there forming by hand, making ravioli every day. And across the street was this beautiful woman in a midriff <laughs> shirt doing whatever she was doing that day or all the time. And he would be daydreaming watching this. And he's, I'm going to make her belly button. So he took the ravioli, pinched it and rolled it. And rolled it around, and that's the formation of the <laughs> tortellini. Now, the only Italians would come up with a story like that. If it's true, I don't know, but it certainly sounds Good great. <laughs> okay, any other questions? What's the, the status of your family's companies now? We're making, we're, okay, so the question is, what is the status of uh, our company now? Um, we are making pasta machinery today. Our machines are still 100% American-made. They, they actually are built in, the, the, the machines are built in Minnesota, but our sales office is in Florida, and we sell to all the big pasta, every single, you know, the big pasta companies are all. And we make a lot of fresh pasta machines. We have a specialty in that area. We make stainless steel, all washed down machines. So just, uh, so like if you eat um, Stouffer's, for example, frozen lasagna, um, th that, those products are made on what's called a washdown machine because there there's meats involved. So you have a, the USDA is involved. Um, so anytime meat, meat touches the product, you have USDA, much higher, really very high st sanitary st standards. So you literally take, take these machines, and if you saw that machine, you saw it earlier, 
the, stain, the big stainless steel one, they scrub this thing with caustic cleaning compounds every day and wash down with fire hoses. It's amazing to see. Literally fire hoses, caustic cleaning compounds to make sure they kill all the pathogens. It's very sensitive towards food safety. It's a very big deal. So, you know, when you have meat, the chances of pathogen is, is a lot higher. So you have to be much take extra steps. Our, our family designed the first wash down extruder that was for these wash down plants. Before they were just taking uh, dry pasta and bringing, ordering it and bringing it in and dumping it into these cookers. Then instead of doing that, these manufacturing companies actually used the extruder and just dumped the fresh pasta right into the, into the cooker instead of having take the pasta, dry it, and then reintroduce water to it again. Why do that? Just, let's just drop it right into the, into the cooker. And that's, that's some technology that US based. And we, we, have, we do all that, that's our specialty. And uh, we're still in business and we're still, we're doing great. This is gonna be the, probably the best year we've had in a long, long time. So um, this is the fourth generation. Now, it could be further back, the fourth generation in the United States. Now, yeah. So my great-grandfather had experience in mills and pasta making in Italy. So he had that yeah. from Mazzala di Valo. There was a Berga flour mill. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so the question is, you know, how, four, how many generations? Well, four in the United States, but it could be, could be more. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have a lot of detail other than I know that it, he, uh, he was involved with his family, the Verga family, which is his, his grandmother, or his mother was a Verga, had a flour mill and pasta factory in, in Montreal, which is right outside of Palermo. Um, so, you know, it could, I don't know how far back it goes, um, maybe, you know, many generations. Now, he was an engineer. He, he worked, my, my great friend in Italy, he worked for, for the Italian railroads, which were actually um, uh, run by the military in those days, uh, at least had a role in it. So that's where he got his training. And uh, my grandfather got his training at the Nautical University in, in Sardinia before coming to the United States. He came to the United States, I think, when he was 14, maybe. He was pretty young. So he had a lot of training, trade school type training at, in Sardinia um, at the Nautical, um, I think it's called the Nautical Institution of, of, um, of Sardinia. So that's any other questions? I love the questions. These are great. I'm very passionate about this, this industry, as you probably yeah. gathered from. So your company makes the large commercial machines, right? Correct. What about the, not the small household machines, but the intermediate, say, for the big operations like Eatly or something like that, where don't they make their own pasta? Yes. In some restaurants? So the question is, we make higher end, you know, higher volume machines. Um, obviously, the, the, the investment in a bigger machine is, is, is significant. If you're going to buy a machine like you saw, it's got to, you know, you got to have, you got to have a big operation to use a machine like that. So what are the, what are these kind of the smaller range restaurants, restaurants do? We do, we do, our company does offer, uh, offer uh, some of that kind of equipment. But really, a lot of that kind of equipment that is very popular is, is really coming from Italy. There's a lot of Italian manufacturers of, of, of machines that are more in the smaller, like 100 pound per hour range that would be more commonly seen in restaurants. Um, so that equipment is available. Um, it is, there is not a, a, a huge, we do make some of it. It's a very limited part of our business. Most of that stuff is coming from Italy. A lot of it is very, you know, a lot of that stuff is very, very nice machines. I personally don't think it's as, as robust as the equipment we make. I mean, when we make a machine, like I said, this, this machine that you, that you see out here, that's in the hallway of this, of this um, museum here from the 30s was used by Fresina uh, Pasta Company all the way up until just a few years ago when it was donated here. And the thing, these things, I see our equipment lasting, that, that's still in operation from the 40s. Mm -hmm. you know, so we do a lot of repair business because they're so, you know, they use these machines for so long. So these things are robust. And when you're talking cast on, castings and foundries and all that, these machines just last, they don't wear, you know, they, don't, they just get outdated, they don't wear out. But, you know, so the smaller range is really, the Italians have a specialty in that. And they're beautiful, a lot of them are really clever. You know, they have some really clever technology. They're beautifully done machines. Italians are great engineers, they really are. I mean, we admire them and respect them tremendously. I've learned a lot from, from the Italians 
and the, the things that, that, they, that they offer and the new technology they come up with. But I'm very proud, too, to say that the Italian-Americans have, have contributed to this industry significantly. So it's something that we should be proud of here in the United States. Wonderful. I, I really have been a marvelous audience. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's uh, been a pleasure. Um, and uh, um, eat more pasta. <laughs> <laughs>